Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Virus and Image Center. My name is Gail Morel, and I'm the exhibitions curator here at the RIC. It is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's event, a discussion between photographer Louis Pelou and guest curator Thierry Gervais about images of war. Louis Pelou is an award-winning documentary photographer whose work has appeared in publications and exhibitions internationally. He is the recipient of numerous accolades, including a National Magazine Award and a Hasselblad Master Award. His photographs are included in public collections, including the Harry Ransom Center, University of Texas at Austin, George Eastman House, and uh, the National Gallery of Canada. His work has been featured on BBC, Al Jazeera, in the New York Times, and in the Globe and Mail, to name a few. He's currently working on a book and a future documentary film on his multi-year study of the war in Afghanistan. Dr. Thierry Gervais is the curator of Dispatch, War Photographs in Print, 1854-2008, currently on view in our main gallery. Thierry Gervais is assistant professor in the School of Image Arts, Ryerson University, and head of research at the RIC. He has published extensively on press photographs and has curated exhibition for the Centre Pompidou Metz, the Musée d'Orsay, and the Jeux de Pomme in France. He organizes annually a three-day symposium on photography at the RIC, and his book on press and photography published in French and English, entitled The Making of Visual Information, will be released in February 2015. Please join me tonight in welcoming Louis Pelou and Thierry Gervais. Thank you. <coughs> thank, thank, thank you, Gail, for this very nice introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight. I just want to give you um, an idea of how the discussion will unfold. Um, Louis is going to talk uh, and present his work for, we said, 50, 10, 10 to 15, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, then I will talk for <coughs> a few minutes just to explain why Louis is in the show and maybe to give you an idea of um, you know, what was the goal of the show. And then we're going to start, you know, having questions. And, uh, and I think that uh, by 7.30, we should open the floor for, uh, for, for questions. Uh, and before he talks, I just want to thank him, uh, to thank him for being in that show. And uh, it's rare to have a public opportunity to do that. So, Louis, thank you for oh, being thanks. here and in the show. Thanks. Uh, I want to start off thanking uh, everybody at Ryerson. There's an army of people that put these things together, and they usually don't get uh, thanked for everything they do. Teddy, Gail, uh, Paul Roth, uh, Val, Chantel, wherever everybody is, uh, Aaron. And I just want to say that uh, I hope you all understand and appreciate what a beacon of light this, this, this image center is. Uh, in this city and in the world. Uh, photography, more than ever, is th the mo most predominant medium, that visual medium that we all participate in and consume every day. And uh, a lot of institutions have not embraced that. And the RIC, I think, is an international leader in that. And I think that, you know, I think we should do a round of applause for a lot of people who put this together. So um, I'm just going to give a little warning. You did come to a lecture on war, so we're going to look at some tough pictures to look at. There's a little bit of video, but uh, I think you all are aware of that and you're ready to see some of this. So I'm going to start off um, with a little video. Oops. Because the reason I show this video is not because I want to show you the action or anything like that. It's because I want you to understand what's going on around me. There's going to be some gunfire in this, so anyone sensitive to gunfire, just beware. Uh, just so you know what's going on around me, what I'm seeing, what's happening around me, and something that you need to keep in mind, war is not just pictures. War is sound and war is smell. Okay, So uh, we can get the sound, we can't get the smell. So some of this video are just clips from the video I shot in Afghanistan between 2006 and 2010. So we'll start with this, and then I'll go through some pictures to give context to the lecture and the conversation me and Teddy are going to have. Fuck me. 
I'm right behind you. Okay, I'm going to stand up because it's just easier for me to do this standing up. So uh, there's a lot we're going to talk about, aesthetics, journalism, uh, politics, issues. But we need to understand that there are real human beings taking those photographs and journalists covering wars. I think it's a big topic of discussion, especially with what's going on in Syria and Iraq. And there are real people in those photographs. So in that context, uh, We'll just continue discussion. So just so you know the kind of person I am and the photographer I am, uh, I was born in Toronto, raised in Toronto. My, my, my parents are Italian immigrants. <clears throat> my first project was uh, in the mines north of Ontario. And uh, if you want to know where all the metals in your phones come from, they come from places like this. 3,000 people have been killed on the job in Ontario working in mines. So in the, in the tradition of what Teddy's done, which I think is brilliant, and I haven't seen it done as well as this, is I want to show you the context in which the work is published as well. A lot of my projects, I, I don't do on assignment. I do it on my own, and then I go to the publications I choose to share these issues or these stories with. So I spent about 12 years on this project. Sudbury, Kirkland Lake, Timmins. Th these are all the places where the metals for your phones come from. I spent about three years editing it, only because I didn't really know what I was doing. Here's a magazine spread. So uh, a lot of photojournalists and, and some people have a problem with journalism and art being in the same thing. But let's understand that some artists, for me, were like journalists. They were socially conscious. Like Diego Rivera, this is a mural called uh, The Agitator. And you know we have. We're doing what's happening in this painting. A community of people are getting together and they're talking about something that's going on that everybody needs to talk about. And that's my goal, is to get people talking about issues I think they need to be talking about. So this is in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm gonna just briefly go through my work. If you wanna see more of my work, you can go to my website and we're gonna be talking more about other stuff. And uh, so uh, this is a civilian who was killed in crossfire in Afghanistan. This is a dead Taliban. You have to understand that when you look at the newspaper that we rely on so much, or the website, or, or a news service, why we don't see the other side sometimes. And I think it's important to consider that in a war, there are two sides of combatants, and both sides are doing the killing. This is a Afghan, wounded Afghan soldier singing to birds, so you know I, I try to cover the spectrum, inhumanity, humanity. 
This is an Afghan soldier eating grapes outside Kandahar City. The land around Kandahar City is, uh, it's like the breadbasket of Afghanistan. The main thing they grow there are grapes for raisins, actually. And I thought for Teddy I'd show the contact sheet. That there's a magazine called Six Months. I can never say it in French, sorry. Uh, and they ask, they do this feature where they, they show, they ask to show the, con the contact sheet. There's no more contact sheets, that's film. But sort of the sequence of images kind of before and after the photo is taken. So, uh, you know, this was shot digitally. So that's the, the frame I, I took right there. And I was trying to do what a lot of lens-based photographers do is show depth and space and focus and out of focus. And the, the moment is right here. Now, when I looked at that picture, I thought, wow, it's like Caravaggio with the grapes, you know? Like, that's my background. I studied painting first, right? And I think there's nothing wrong with that as a sort of a visual base. This is it in context in the Virginia Corley Review, which is an academic publication of the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. And I think you know, the, the gutter, the split in the page is right here. So I, this is like, for me, really great photo editing. But I always attach something social to, to all my stories. And this, is, uh, this also had a story on landmines or IEDs, the homemade bombs, and sort of the effects on humans. Here's a spread from the Toronto Star showing frontline combat in Kandahar. This is a, uh, an image that became well known through uh, another show that Houston to the Houston Museum of Fine Arts toured. Of course, when I shoot digitally, it's always color. That I have no choice in that. Uh, they wanted to run the photo in color in the exhibition. It's black and white. But I, I like it in black and white, and I'll tell you why. Because aesthetically, for me, the color is romantic. For other people, the black and white's romantic. But as the artist, that's what I chose. And I also felt like these Marines were like turned to stone for me from their experience. But this is a portrait, I, I collected portraits that the Marines did of each other too, just in terms of how people, what the perception of themselves are. And he likes, he likes the portrait I did of him as well, but this is a photograph one of his fellow Marines did of him. Here's, it's in an exhibition in the context of art in an art museum. It's an ad. This is, you know, photography. Uh, and I'm showing you just all the different ways in, the, the photos are used in different contexts. So this is a photography magazine. Photographers talking about photographers. And you know, there are all these people who started seeing these portraits and they have a whole collection of drawings people have done of, of these portraits that they've sent me actually. That's in the exhibition as well. And see, you know, it's rare now, like in Vietnam it was very common. They, people write stuff on their helmets now, they're not allowed to. So that was a really rare picture to have that. But uh, what I want to point out is too, when you look at the news, there's always ads. You know, advertising and commerce is a part of the press. And I just love, it's like, you know, life insurance with war pictures, you know. But this is a, 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 a photo from the Vietnam and this is a photo from Afghanistan. Uh, th this is a photograph I, I've never shown before. It, it, it's from a sequence from a photo that's become really popular. Someone call, some people call it the blue man, but th this is in the back of the ambulance. This is in the back of the helicopter. And it's blue, it's aesthetic, but that's the blue light in the back of the helicopter. So I'm a pretty straight shooting photographer. I, I, don't, I, I don't do much other than point my lens and take pictures. I don't, I, I, I'm, there's no manipulation in my photographs. I follow a code of ethics from the National Press Photographer Association. Here's an article in uh, Canadian Art. And uh, Every, when everybody thinks of war, right, we think of like two armies getting on a battlefield and fighting and that's war. Well, war is many more things nowadays. War is as much about politicians, corporations who make weapons, and the voting public who votes for those governments that send people to war, start wars, or get involved in wars. So I, I want everybody to think outside the box, like those mines. Well, there's a mine in Sudbury called the Fruit Stovey Mine, where 40% of all Allied artillery was made for the Second World War. I mean, just think, one mine made almost all the artillery. So when we think of Mexico, right? We think of uh, that scribble there is courtesy of my niece. Uh, we think, you know, vacation, right? Let, let's just think of perceptions, the way we see things, okay? And Mexico is a great place. It's, it's a multi-layered place. It is a great place for vacations. It's also in the middle of a drug war. This is a government press release photo of the Mexican government, making sure they have the federal police logo with, with the, the, the alleged criminals they've arrested. And what I want you to understand is no one talks about Mexico. This list of people I'm gonna show you from 2007 till now are the names of over 100 Mexican journalists murdered 
while covering the drug war. Okay, look, look how long this list is, all right? So when we talk about wars, there are noise in the Middle East. And you think this is not connected to Toronto. Well, next time someone does a line of cocaine, and I'm not judging people who use drugs, all these murders are connected to the smuggling of all those drugs. And these are the issues I like to get people talking about, and I like to use my photography to do it. If you want to know more about journalists being killed around the world, you should go to the Committee to Protect Journalists, and they have an amazing website. You can learn a lot about the world and what's going on about journalists who cover conflict. Uh, I covered the Mexican drug war for about two years. I covered over 100 murders in my first month there. And from, from executions to police brutality to you know, refugees. When, when people stream across the border in the US, there's many more dimensions and layers to why they're, they're, they're coming across the border. She, this woman's from Chiapas, probably the poorest state in the entire country. And not only that, it's the entry route from the southern border where all the drugs are smuggled. Now, the drug cartels in Mexico are not guys in the corner selling dime bags of pot with a pistol in their pocket. These are armed groups of irregular army units who are fighting over a multi-billion dollar business that is around the world. It's in this city, it's in every city in, our, in the world. So here's a feature in the Globe and Mail that I, I featured my Mexico work, and I just want to point out there's a car ad down here. You know, when you're looking at the newspaper, look at, look at the whole thing like a landscape, the trees, the mountains, the ads, the headlines, the text. Did the photographer write the text or did someone else write the text? Who was there photographing it? Who did the writing? Was the writing done here? You know? Mental illness, no one talks about mental illness in war. Mental illness happens a lot after the war or when people come back from a war. You don't have to be physically wounded to come back from a war wounded. Now see, this is what comes back to why I like art a as a base to why I do everything. Th this is, you know, Francisco Goya did a series called The Disasters of War. For me, this is some of the most important art ever created from what I do relative to what I do because it's the documenting of human rights violations when the Napoleonic armies invaded Spain. And you know what's important about this? Is he made etchings. That means he made it so he could reproduce them and make multiple copies. He didn't do paintings one off and hang it in a salon in a gallery. He made it so he thought about this. It was very calculated. So he could make multiple copies and show people what happened. And that's pretty much the tradition I like to work in. If you want to see more of my work, that's my website. Just look up Louis Pouli, you'll get the first hit. And then there's all the other platforms we have now, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and that's my presentation. So I think we can move to the conversation now. Well, thank you. <coughs> thank you so much, Louis, for this um, presentation, slideshow, and um, the mix of images that we've, you've been... Is that mic high <coughs> enough? I don't know. I feel like I'm louder and you're not. How about that? Uh, Is that better? Is that better now? No. It might be your scarf. Okay. No, I won't take it off. Uh, <laughs> I worked a lot on that. Um, yeah, thank you for, for all of the images that you've shown us, and I think it's um, it's exactly telling why um, I think why I'm so happy to have you in the show. Um, <coughs> I selected Louis' uh, work uh, for for multiple reasons, but the first one I, I is very obvious. I mean, I, I think just that I admire uh, his work. Um, and his work as a journalist, but also as a photographer. And I, I, I'm making, you know, a distinction between uh, between uh, the two. Um, and I and I also thought that it would be very interesting uh, for the show because uh, Louis um, is, uh, for me, the perfect example of the contemporary practice in terms of photojournalism and how. Um, Photojournalism, it's not just news. Um, photojournalism, it's press. Photojournalism, it's also art galleries. Um, photojournalism, it's photo, but it's also videos. And, um, and that, that's definitely part of the work. And finally, uh, and, and, and that's for me very, very, very important. I mean, we clearly acknowledge uh, the visual culture and the visual background uh, that uh, engaged him in uh, what he's doing now. And uh, it might appear obvious for a lot of us to have a presentation like this, like the one you just did, 
uh, I have not seen a lot like this where uh, you have a photojournalist coming and, and talking about war photograph and, um, and, and, and showing us uh, Diego Rivera and at the same time. Or, um, and, and I think that we, uh, that we have to take that opportunity to maybe talk about photojournalism and war photography in another way. I agree with you. I mean, uh, people are involved. And, uh, and, but the goal of that exhibition was also to say that uh, maybe to better understand what is at stake, uh, we should uh, look at the images as, as representation uh, to uh, know what is working and not working, what is uh, uh, effective, efficient you know, on us uh, when we are looking at images. Um, the, the, <coughs> the entire goal of the show is basically to say that, um, of course, we have to take the photograph, but we also have to take the photograph the right way. Uh, and the explanation of that, I mean, it's through the fresca, uh, is showing that, you know, what, what is good, a good photograph, what was a good photograph for the 19th century, I mean, for, for the press, um, might not be a good photograph nowadays. And, um, and it means that um, it's one thing to take the photograph and it's another one to make it um, uh, efficient uh, toward the, the readership. So that, that's, that's the, the idea of the show. That's why Louis uh, is in that uh, contemporary uh, section with a mix of uh, prints and, and layouts. Um, I mean, this is working, I think, quite well. I mean, the fact that the, your photograph for the galleries are in black and white and, uh, and for the press are in color. And um, I'd love to, to, to start with, the, um, with you talking, yes, about your background. And your training, where did you go? I mean, how did you end it as a photojournalist? And, and, um, and what do you have in mind before taking the photograph? Well, let's see. I failed religion class in high school. <laughs> it was a rebellion thing. No offense, it was very religious. I just, it was just a rebellion thing. I was being told you have to learn this. I went to summer school, I started listening to punk rock, and I was listening to the lyrics, it wasn't just the cool guitars. And the first thing I, I, I there's no, who, it, it, the Catholic school I went to was like, who's gonna fill a religion? So there's no summer school for religion. So when I got there, the, the only class I was interested in was American history actually. And it wasn't about the American history, it's just my teacher was a Vietnam draft dodger. And he like indoctrinated me into sort of challenging the system. And uh, I met a girl, she was taking a photography class, and of all the things out of nowhere, I had no idea who Don McCullen was, she bought me a book by Don McCullen. And I looked at that book, and if you don't know who Don McCullen is, he's a really important British photojournalist. He's still alive, uh, covered Vietnam amongst many other conflicts up through the 80s and then a little bit into the 90s, the Central American Wars. And I just looked at that book and I thought, you know, I didn't know this at the time, I realized this recently, that my parents were born before the Second World War in a part of Italy where there was a lot of conflict and a lot of poverty. And my whole street were all parents like my parents. So it was like I was with all these people who just kept telling me stories. When I was your age, you better finish eating that plate of food I just put in front of you because when, during the war. And I had no idea that it was putting two things into me storytelling, knowing where you're from, and war. And that war was a part of where I came from. And I think that everybody in their lives are always kind of trying to understand, hey, where am I from? What are my roots? I think these are things that are really important to us all. Uh, I had a lot of default answers, like mm, I'm a journalist and this is an important issue. And yeah, that is part of it. But uh, I think it's, it was, became very personal for me. I don't chase after wars. The wars I went to had something related to my past or, or my upbringing. And so uh, after that summer, I had that book by Don McCullen. I went to the library and I found Alfred Stieglitz and Man Ray and I loved art. My parents always uh, encouraged me to study art. My dad would show me books by Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he, 
This was taught in school, in elementary school. Imagine he only went to grade six and he had learned about the Renaissance. Uh, says something for how important schools can be in shaping somebody. But, uh, and so it was always about art. And then I took a photography course to take reference photos for my painting, because painting was what I did first. And then I thought, wow, forget painting. I don't want to be by myself. I want to go out and meet people in the world. And so I took a photo class. And uh, I went to, I think it was like Sherburne and Queen. This is in the 80s. And there were a lot of homeless men around that area. And that was the first thing to start photographing. And I got to meet people and understand where they had come from, why they were in the situation they were in. And that really engaged me. I really felt like I was doing something that meant something to me. And then from there, I became the high school yearbook photographer. And uh, that was my first of many unpaid gigs where I got a credit. Any photographers in the crowd will laugh at that. Uh, you'll get a credit, I can't pay you. Uh, and then I, I went to the Ontario College of Art. It was just that when I went there. And uh, I think my hair was down to here. And, uh, uh, and then I graduated and I just started, I just went out and started working. And there you, you, you had history of art classes. You have yes. you had the regular training as an, Ver as an artist. Yes, v very important, you know. I, I did life drawing, <coughs> sculpture, uh, typography, and uh, I, I always felt like I don't have a problem as long as I do it ethically, my version of, of, of what ethics are, uh, of, of making a picture that you go, wow, what is that? Then you read the article or you, you research it and you look it up and you go, holy cow, my government's doing this and we're funding that and we're, we're, we're sending troops to this. And I just think that decisions made by governments that send people to war, it, war is not a press release. You know, We get these press releases, the government's doing this. And I'm not speaking for or against, I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist. I get the information I show you. you. You are a part of war too, you are the voters. You are the voters who elect the governments. And that's why when it's time to vote, it's always important to go to vote. So I'm just a cog in the, in the wheel, in the machine, okay? I, I say, hey, think about that before you do that. You know, where are your tax dollars going? And if I can make a picture and you're, you're interested in that picture and it gets you into that issue, then that's what my goal is. And how would you talk about that training and its influence on your work mm -hmm. now? I mean, in the fact of, you know, when you are taking photographs. Yep. I mean, how it's coming? Is it? Yeah, I'll, I'll take, not. for example, like, you know, in 2010, I was on a medevac mission. It's like a helicopter ambulance that the U.S. Army had. We were flying into a landing zone. And there was a, a firefight going on. And as we were coming in, this dust blew up in the air and I thought, oh my God, it's a William Turner painting. And I, I, I was just taking pictures as the gunfire was going on and I just thought that I love, who doesn't love his paintings? I mean, they're, they're phenomenal paintings. Or, now when I took the great picture, I wasn't thinking, I think it was a subconscious thing. It was like, a, you know, Caravaggio deep in my mind. But uh, mm. I don't look at, at art books as much anymore, but say Juan Miro, like those compositions, structurally, what if it's a real situation and things are moving and, and it just kind of happens. Sometimes things like some of those firefights, things are happening so fast I don't have time to think. It, it, it's a subconscious thing. But sometimes I do have to think like, wow, that is pretty phenomenal. Like, like the portraits of the, so, the, the Marines inside, inside the, the show. Like one thing I did think I thought, I'd covered combat for two and a half months and I have the soldiers going to the front, soldiers feeling emotion, people being killed, em, uh, action, all these sorts of things that we see over and over, every photographer covers the war. And then I went to this base and it was like all these Marines and I thought of you know, the Joe Rosenthal photograph of the famous flag raising of Iwo Jima and I thought, why don't, why don't we know who all those guys are? You know? And I thought, I wanna make a series of pictures where you get to meet those guys. I want them to look out at you. I want you to know how old they are, what town they're from, because I, I wanna try and create that bridge just to make you think. And let's talk about this series, and uh, it, it, it's a series, and uh, using a very specific style, which is the documentary style. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> how, did, uh, how did you come to that? I mean, how did you set up, mm -hmm. you know, the, the entire series? Because it's referring yes. to another story, which is, you know, the, the one of Walker Evans and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of that. Yes. And, um, could you talk to us about that? Yeah, uh, so when I got to that base, I'd tried, <coughs> I tried, I wanted to do a portrait series, and uh, 
a, a very influential portrait photographer who, whose work I looked at at a very young age was Avedon's American West. I just felt like I didn't like the white background for, for my work. I, I, I appreciate his work for it on its own. And I wanted to do a series of portraits, and I kept taking a lot of bad portraits all summer. They were like really bad. And what happened was, was really, you know, you're out in natural light, and I wanted something that was a little more intimate, and I wanted the lighting to be better. I wanted the lighting to be better, and uh, I wanted like a, I wanted a frontline combat studio. You know, this is what I was hoping for, like what Irving Penn did in some of his work. And I got there, and they had this great bunker. It was like this sandbag in case there was a mortar attack. And every day I, I went out on patrol, and I thought I, I'm going to keep repeating myself with these combat pictures. So after patrol or combat, I would take, I would talk to the marine for days or hours, getting to know I was there for a few months, and they they started wondering like, why are you taking pictures when we're out? doing stuff. I said, no, I'm getting to know you. They thought I was kind of odd. And I would take them in there, and it's all natural light. It's just with a 50 millimeter lens. And I would just talk to them, and I would say, just stand there, and they would look at the camera, and I would just, I think the photography took two or three minutes per Marine. Mm -hmm. Some joked around and made funny <coughs> faces. I edited those out. And, and you know what's interesting, and I, I think this is a good point of conversation, is, you know, we talk about censorship, right? So if, if I took a thousand photos of Marines, is it more about what I'm showing you or more about what I'm not showing you? <laughs> so am I, am I censoring or am I editing? You know, a, any sort of media critics, I love getting into these conversations with them because I kind of agree with them. So I take 1,000 photos, I show you 15. Now what do we call that? You know? So it, it, it's my first-hand impression or experience of what I saw and experienced. And that's what ha ends up happening. Uh, in terms of the series, Part of it is, you know, 15 guys is a platoon, so it's, it's like a, a unit, so to speak. Uh, but I think that each individual carries something that you can engage with one by one. And y you know what's better about a gallery versus you're in a coffee shop and you're just flipping through the New York Times or the Globe and Mail, is that you're in a room, you're kind of by yourself, even though other people are around, you're, you're there and you're engaged with the wall. You're in an enclosed space where you can think, and you can focus on what am I looking at, what is my connection to this work, or my disconnection with this work. And I think that the newspapers, no one goes in, in a, a box like this to go look at the newspaper, which I think makes museums and galleries much more important in some ways in engaging with this work. than Because what do we do? It's like, wow, Britney Spears shaved her head. Okay, let's see. There's a war in Syria. Yeah, 100 journalists got killed in Mexico. Let me finish my, my coffee. And we all do that, right? Because there's just too much going on in our lives, right? But you come to an institution like that, and that's the value of institutions like this, when we have shows like this. <coughs> Let's follow up. OK. Um, <laughs> I, I really wanted you to talk about that aspect, that multifaceted aspect of the work of photojournalists and, and through the uses of your, your images. <coughs> and um, I would love you to continue to elaborate on that and on the impact of the images, because basically what you just said to us is that photographs reproduced in the press don't have any impact anymore or have more impact when they are shown in an art gallery, and that's why you diversified your work is it what you're saying? P partly, partly. I don't mean to be a politician and give a flip-flop around answer, but uh, y you know, I just think that th the world is so much, is full of so much visual noise, like there's just so much out there. There's so much. And I think that what's important about the news is that you actually understand the source of your news. I, I have a friend who said, oh my God, I had heard about this issue in Iran, and I'm like, what website did you read that on? I, they gave me some blog that I'd never heard of. Not, not that not there's anything wrong with blogs, but I just thought, you know, the great thing about the internet is it keeps people honest to a degree. If someone writes something inaccurately in something, they get called out pretty fast. Plagiarism, you're caught pretty fast now. So I think that I got to try and engage people, whether it's Instagram or, like this week, I've taken over the Instagram account for the Smithsonian Magazine. I'm connecting with people all over the world using my pictures. If they want to go to a link to look at my website, or if they want to research more, great. 
But, but I, I think that having the physical object that the photographer made, th there, there is something about having, that's, that's not my phone. <laughs> uh, moment of humor. We kind of need it, eh? That's kind of dark uh, content. Oh shit, that's my phone. <laughs> no, I, I have a Canadian and a US phone. I hope that's not an assignment. <laughs> wow, feeling really smart right now. Okay. <laughs> Stop ringing. Uh, I, I think that, you know what's funny is history repeats itself. See, a, a, a lot of people don't realize, and I think that that's the brilliance of what Teddy did here is that you see something, you're like, oh wow, this is so unique, or this is different, or that's been done. Well, the first time images of dead U.S. soldiers were shown to the American public were in an exhibition. It was after the Battle of Antietam, Alexander Gardner's photographs, and the New York Times wrote an article about the exhibition, kind of like a review, actually. So we have to understand the fundamentals and the history behind image making and the, the way I can engage all of you. Like, you know what's great? I got a captive audience right here, and we just talked about the drug war in Mexico, Afghanistan, you as voters, where the medals come from in your phones, what are the politics of labor behind the people who work in those mines? These are all great things that I hope all of you, that's, like, forget about my pictures. That's just the, the starting point, and that's what my pictures are, a starting point. You all can go back and you're empowered now. This is, this is the thing, and I think that the, the great thing about this, this is like that Diego Rivera pa painting. It's a meeting point where we can kind of get together and as a community say, hey, you know, what's going on in our world right now? And the beginning of all that is the photograph for this group. It could be something else for another group. But, you know, why not look at pictures and be engaged and it, it affect you subconsciously and consciously? This is what I think, th what, what an institution like this does that almost no institution or platform does. Because in the web, there's so many distractions. Here, it's like a focused place where you can think and meditate on things. That is key to an institution like this. But yeah, there are people I don't reach. This, this thing where I, I see some, some of my colleagues say, I'm, uh, that photo changed the world. No, the photo didn't change the world. People changed the world. The photo is a tool. The photo is something you can use to learn from or start a conversation. And is everybody going to get the message that I'm trying to convey? No. It's kind of like reading you know, Paradise Lost by Milton. I think I'm still in the Coles notes. That's a generation thing. Is there a Coles anymore? But you know, you read that, some people are like, what the hell, that book? And I read it, I'm like, I'm finally, after 10 years, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm halfway through, you know? But it, it's about constantly engaging in things. And you know, I look out in the crowd here, and there's a lot of good friends of mine who are out there who are also photographers. And, and it's, about, it's about a collective, it's about a cooperative. It's about like the artists in Paris in the 30s getting together and sharing ideas. It's about exchanging ideas, you know? I learn when I'm in the coffee shop watching how people look at the news. And this is the seed. Institutions like this are the seed, the beginning of all of that. <coughs> and um, you also know that it's also very controversial to um, exhibit um, photojournalism in an art gallery. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a good example in the show with uh, the dead Taliban by, by Delay, mm -hmm. who, who has caused a lot of discussion. And wha what do you think about that? Well, does everybody know what we're talking about? There's a photograph of a dead Taliban fighter. Mm -hmm. And just for context, Luc Delahaye, who, who's a remarkable French photographer, covered the war just after the invasion, after 9-11. And uh, he took two versions of the photograph. And it's brilliantly shown in here where he used one camera, just a regular 35 millimeter camera, to photograph the dead body of this Taliban. And I'll point out the brilliance of that picture is his empty wallet above him and his missing shoes. I mean, you want to understand the, 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 the inhumanity of war. That means they robbed him and stole his shoes or his boots. I've seen that happen. It's, it's one of the, 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 the lowest <coughs> moments of seeing war, actually, to see that, to rob the dead. Uh, but Luke Delahaye, then he had a panoramic camera, and he made these panoramic photographs. And then... He had photos for the press, like the media, and then he had this art show of art, and he hung this, and he was criticized, hanging work as art for enjoyment. I, I don't accept the criticism because I don't know how much enjoyment anyone's getting from looking at a dead body. I think most people are shocked. And 
I think the people who look at it as enjoyment is the people who are only stuck in maybe the art world thinking, wow, this is art, this is problematic for me. Well, maybe it's good to be problematic. I'm glad, I think it should be controversial. I think we should be fighting and arguing over this stuff. Because as, as we've seen in the news, I think that's a great thing the news is now, is look, look what's happening in the world. Well, Ebola showed up in Dallas. I mean, this is kind of scary, right? Or how many people have been killed in Syria now? So I, I, I it's, it's a bold thing for him to do. Whether there's, I, I haven't had a conversation with him about it, so I, I don't know what his personal reasons were. But I, I'm, I'm, we should have, we can't have photographs like that. I don't want to shock people. I want to teach people as well. But this is war, right? Like, what I showed you tonight, this is nothing. I have, like, folders and boxes of photographs that, to show you, you'd leave here, you'd go to the bar and have about five shots of whiskey. I have stuff like heads and the, the things that war does, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And in our publications, a lot of that stuff never gets published. It was very fascinating to see there's a magazine with someone holding someone's head. I mean, th that, that would never be published now. But, you know, beheadings have been going on long before James Foley. And just so you know, in terms of imagery and the control of imagery, is what did you, has everyone seen, you know, everybody talking about the journalist who was, they made the video, he's, he was in Syria or Iraq and ISIS had him on his knees in an orange jumpsuit. When I think of orange jumpsuits and people on their knees, I think of the photograph of, Gu of detainees in Guantanamo on their knees with an orange jumpsuit on. The terrorists are using our, the government's own pictures against them to say, hey, we're in power now. So I think what's important is to understand the source of your images. And I got asked in an interview recently, should we not watch the video, because the video of the beheading. And look, I think we're in a democratic and free society. If we're showing pictures of one side doing the killing, that we should see both sides. But these are terrorists, and their goal is for you to watch that video. So uh, I'm a journalist. I'm not saying this from a government point of view. You watch it, you're helping them achieve their goal. So what, what I'm saying is the difference between what Luke Delahaye did is he's saying, hey, I went to a war, this is the reality of war, whether I hang in a gallery or put in a publication, for me it's the same thing. And at the same time, you, you, you have, because that's what you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. You are yep. uh, publishing your images and showing your images in art galleries or image center like here, like here. I think uh, there is a difference between an art gallery and, um, and an image center like here. And, uh, but at the same time, you have two different strategies. If uh, Luc Delay is using two different cameras, as you explained, the panoramic and uh, for the art gallery to produce very sharp images for the art galleries, and the SLR to produce blurry images, uh, that are published full bleed on uh, on the opening of Newsweek, which I think it's a very interesting paradox. I mean, the sharp image for the gallery and the blurry one for the press. I mean, th I think that the show is also um, showing that and explaining that. I mean, what was blurry during the 19th century wasn't published in the press, um, but nowadays it's 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 what's blurry, which is published. Anyways, um, and you you are not using two cameras. You are using one, but you are producing two kind of images from one. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And uh, why? I mean, you understand? Yeah, yeah. Why, why? I mean, you, you, you talked a bit about it. Yeah, so uh, wh what I like about how you prefaced your question was the word strategy, and that's what I have. I'm going to places none of you can go to. We all have a stake in knowing about these things. And so it's about a strategy, right? Uh, I still try and operate ethically. I try and balance, you know, it, it, it's not easy. Uh, and that's why I showed that video ahead of time. Uh, do I want someone's mother to see a photo of them dead? Do I want my mother to see a photo of me dead? You know, I gotta try and balance out these sensitivities. And sometimes that does get uh, eclipsed by the importance of what's happening in my photographs that I really feel like no one's paying attention, I'm not, I'm not seeing it in the news, and I need to sort of like ring the bell a little bit, ring your bell a little bit, and wake, wake, wake you up a little bit. Uh, and I, I just like to work very basically. I, I think I, when I go photograph, not to get into equipment, but I use two lenses and two cameras, and that's it. A 35 millimeter lens and a 50 millimeter lens. I don't use, uh, I don't have a bunch of 
for covering daily news when I, when I have to pay the bills and the assignments, I have a whole bunch of equipment. But it's pretty straightforward. It's me and what's, what the content and what's happening. You know, I, I, uh, I just feel like the equipment, I don't want the equipment uh, becoming a, uh, sorry, that ringing is throwing me off my, I forgive you, it's okay. It's okay. Sorry to call you out. Uh, well, that's a cool ring. Uh, I don't want the equipment overtaking what I'm doing. I need to be really simple. For me, it's uh, the best way of making something, for making a, an object, whether it's a digital object or a paper object, is to keep it simple. Like one lens, one camera, and it's about what I'm seeing and just making it simple. I, I, I see photographers out there who got like all this stuff hanging off them and I'm just wondering, how do you even, how do you engage with what you're witnessing? And I, and I try and keep it very simple. And I also don't want it to distract between, uh, I mean, in Luke Dalley's case, there's a dead body, so there's not much going on. But uh, I don't want it to become an intrusion or I want to minimize the intrusion between me and the subject. So I don't want to be changing lenses and doing all sorts of things like that. And I think that uh, I have used some different cameras, but spanned over years. But when I go in the field, it's two cameras, two bodies, and that's it, pretty much. So you don't have you, you don't have one for art and one for photography. No, no. no. Okay. And <clears throat> something. I mean, I remember one of the first time we met. And we were talking about photojournalism, about war, and uh, you you said that you, you need to you need to watch my videos. I said, yeah, okay, I need it. okay, I, I would be happy to see them, but uh, I'm here to talk about photographs. And said, yeah, but you you need to you need to watch them. I said, okay, so I watch them, and uh, and uh, and that the one uh, which are exhibited in the in the show. And uh, and then we started to talk, and uh, and you you explained to me how you came to choose a video camera, and um, you said, uh, well, photojournalists were taking still photographs, and um, and TV crews were way too <coughs> heavy to be on the front line, so with a video camera, I was capable of producing different images. Different images. And that's something that is coming, you know, very regularly in the way you're talking about your images. You know, when you talked about the series of soldiers, you said, well, I took these photographs, so now I wanted to do something different. Could you talk about that idea of being different? And what does it mean in your work uh, as a photojournalist slash artist? When I say different, I mean, in the span of the history of photography, I don't know, there can't be too much different because someone's always done what you've done before you. you. Just Maybe you haven't... That's why I'm a real big student of history. Someone's always done what you've done before you. It, it's just about engaging in your time, what, what you're doing in your time. And I kind of get bored, to be honest, doing everything always the same way. And I think that's why I'd be a horrible assignment photographer because... I'd be like, God, I have to use that camera, or I have to do that like that again. It's a, I did that photo essay already. And uh, I just felt like what had happened in 2000s, I mean, I had shot Super 8 and played with film for a long time, but I never really produced anything I showed publicly. What had happened in 2007 was the TV crews, th it was difficult for them to get around and do frontline stuff, especially the way I, if you've seen the little TV screens in there. Uh, their vehicle hit an anti-tank mine. It blew the CBC cameraman's foot off. And then the TV pool was like, no more going out. Stay on the base, and you're going to do live hits from the base. Like, so-and-so reporting live from Kandahar. And they are live from Kandahar, but they're not what's called over the wire in the front lines. Uh, so I said, hey, look, uh, I'm covering a lot of combat. I'm freelance. Give me a video camera, but it, uh, it's got to be this big. I got to put it in my pouch of my body armor and I'll, I'll, I'll get video for you. And they're like, great. I said, but I own the copyright. It's one of the few times I said that <laughs> in my career. And uh, I went out and I went on this combat operation and this firefight broke out and it was so loud. And I just I felt like being a photographer was like much lower on the list now because there's no audio. It, it, war is about sound, not just gunfire. War is about people who are dying, the sound of flesh, 
the smell. I tell you, you know, I look at those Goya drawings and I know exactly what that smells like, okay? Photogra photographs are, are not perfect in terms of their role in the media, but they are an entry point to understanding the issues at hand. And so I, I started watching the video and I thought, wow, I could make a series of videos. And what the Atlantic magazine approached me and said, hey, we like what you're doing there. Uh, we want to run a photo essay in the magazine. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, let's, let's do a video series online. And so uh, we, I shot a series of one or two minute little clips very much in line with, in, in film, you know, I, I like watching Alfred Hitchcock. And Alfred Hitchcock's cameraman and his, his way of cinematography is the single take. Very famous, innovating the single take. And I just thought, minimum editing, I don't want people messing with my work too much. I don't want editors getting too involved. These single takes, showing you what the front line's like. And so when I got back in 2008, we narrated over it to give it context, and they put like a little nine-part series. It's still on the website, actually, on the, on the Atlantic's website. And I just felt like it was just a new way of engaging. So, okay, okay, I saw the portraits. Yeah, okay, I saw those portraits. I, the photo combat, yeah, I saw the photo essay. But it's like, hey, but I got videos now. So I keep engaging you. And, and part of it is aesthetics. Part of it is, hey, this is the work that looks like paintings. This is the work that's, I have actually used a panoramic camera. I, I, you haven't seen that yeah. stuff. I have you, anyway, it, it's about, it, it's my vision, it's my belief system, it's all the fundamentals I talked to you about of the tradition I like to work in. Um, but it's continually sort of engaging you in these important ideas. A and, and me sort of crafting these being an artist. I think that's an important part of it. Because if, if visually, if, if it didn't stir something in your head, there's a lot of pictures out there. But uh, w which ones do you lock in on and say, hey, wow, what's this about? And then you're like, hmm, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And then, oh, my God, this is happening? And, and, and so that, that, that's the important part. And that's why... I, I, if I'm, it's not happening in the pictures, then I'll just change the format of the pictures. It's like platforms, whether it's magazines or prints or online. I'm glad we have all these different platforms. I think it's really important. But, but this is the fundamental to all those platforms. Yeah, no, I think you are making a very good point, which is uh, uh, also the fact that uh, you have to adjust your images to the platform. And a video for a, a, a website was probably the... the <laughs> most accurate uh, medium uh, for the platform. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, if I could just expand on one thing. You know, when I did shoot those videos, they're about moments. Not, not moments in a row, but they're like Cartier-Bresson moments, like the jump. So it's, it's a moment. It's multiple pictures, but it's still a moment. It, it's still photography for me. So sorry, I just wanted to add that in there. No, but I think this is this is totally uh, the subject. I mean, it's uh, uh, we we we've talked a lot about uh, windows open to the world, but I think uh, the the choice of video is also explaining uh, that the photograph is not uh, responding to that. I mean, that photographs are, uh, have missing components, like you said, the sound, the smell, all of that, and video was probably an alternative to uh, to that. Um, I was I was also. Um, um, I saw the the raw file of the of the the video that uh, Louis did, and uh, and after that I saw the the videos that were online, and I was amazed by something: the fact that the the voiceover is yours, and you are the one telling the story. And and I and I imagine that you were also editing these videos, which is something rare uh, in uh, the publication process. And um, I, could, you, could you talk <coughs> uh, uh, about your relationship with the picture editor or the press editor, the artistic director of magazines, and how are you involved in that process? One of the goals of the show was to explain that uh, when the photograph is taken, it has to be published, and this is an entire process involving many figures. And we don't have very often the opportunity to talk about that. Could you talk about that from the inside? Sure. So uh, I've been a photographer for 23 years. My time flies. 23 years, and uh, I got out of school. I started freelancing. I freelanced for 10 years, like the Globe and Mail, different magazines. And uh, they're usually one-off assignments. I, I didn't really get to go on some dream trip somewhere. And I just felt like... Uh, I didn't feel personally engaged with the assignments. I mean, I, I, I felt like I did a great job on those assignments, 
But I felt like uh, I would see the layout, and uh, this will cover some other territory that we, we started on earlier. I would see type on my photographs, and I'm like, see, in, a, in an art gallery, you can't, can't put type on my photograph. Um, that's one thing I do like. Uh, maybe I like or don't like the framing. I do like the framing here, by the way, just to <laughs> say. Uh, but um, it is about trying to preserve that experience I had. And I think that preserving that experience is really important. That's why, you know, when I see photos that illustrate something, sometimes, I, sometimes not always, I have a problem with that because it's kind of like, but wait a second, who wrote that caption? Did the photographer write that caption? Or did they strip the caption and any photographers who's worked in the press in this room, right, you know, where you, it's hijacked, the caption's hijacked, there's no context, and they put a quote from somebody that has nothing to do with the photograph, but has something to do with an event that happened that the photograph's illustrating. And that's why I think especially now, more than ever, especially with these little news, electronic news devices you got in your pockets, you got to really learn what the sources and the creators of those pictures are, or of those articles. Because I've done stories in Afghanistan and the writer's here. And it's like, but wait a second. This is an ongoing argument going back to Eugene Smith and why he quit Life Magazine. Anyone who doesn't know if Eugene Smith in here needs to look, make a note on your phone. Uh, and it goes back to preserving, for me it's about preserving the core essence of what I experienced and what I witnessed and making sure that it's truthful, as truthful as it can be as a representation as a photograph to what I personally saw. And that's why I think photo reporters, if I can call them that, are really important because I can't take a picture from a mile away. I gotta, kinda, I gotta be right there, you know. I guess now you've got Google Earth. You got all these different technologies, but those can be manipulated by governments. You know, when I'm there, like if you look at, I, I have, you know, if you look at a, a Google Earth map of, of a military base in Afghanistan, it's blurred. You, you can't see it, and that's why being there in person and taking the photograph, I think, for reporting or or if you're there in person writing, can't be beaten. So knowing who these people are, who are the creators of this work and seeing places where people are being killed for doing that work should make you understand that what they're photographing, what they're writing about, no one wants you to know about. So the places, that's why that committee to protect journalists is really important, is uh, the author of that work is very important. So I, I think that you really, like when we read our favorite books, it, look, when I read Moby Dick, I, I don't want to find out, oh my God, he, he didn't write that? Like, that's why we cherish these authors of whatever the work is, is because it came from that one person. And I think that that's really important, is that we can track down who that person was, where they came from, why they did it, and I think that th that's how you need to look at the news nowadays. Did I veer off your question there? Kind of, and I, I Sorry, have a follow-up. Sorry, hit me back again. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I have a follow-up, because you were referring to Eugene Smith, who is one of these, you know, fathers of uh, photojournalism, and you were referring to the editing process, and uh, we all almost know the story about, you know, the Dr. Schweitzer, and how, I uh, mean, the, the, the series by Smith was edited drastically, and he was very unhappy about that, and there was a huge exchange of, uh, of mails between, I think it was Thompson, who was uh, the managing editor of Life at that moment, and Smith, and Thompson said to, to, to Smith, well, you need to be able to get a step back to do a good series of images. And, that, and do, do you think that's right? Do you think that, I mean, how, do, do, do you think that you have, um, your relationship mm -hmm. with pictures editors have brought that element that you can't have because, as you said, you were there. Uh, in defense of some editors and some publications that I've worked for, I think sometimes the photographer might not understand the best way of clearly conveying a story, or it's just a bunch of random pictures that aren't cohesive until an editor comes in and kind of puts it together. Uh, I, I found one of the main reasons I've remained an independent photographer for most of my career is that, just so you understand all this work I've done, I've gone out and done it on my own. Edit it, and then show them maybe a broader edit, but I don't, I don't when they start asking for the whole folder or the contact sheets, I get kind of a little worried because it's not uncommon to be somewhere and you're in Kandahar and someone's in Toronto like, well, this is the story today. And I thought, no, it's not. That's, I'm here. And, you know, sometimes 
the media, not all, not all, there's a lot of good media out there, a lot of good journalists who work really hard at doing great stories that are important. But a lot of times, they will predetermine what the story is, but sometimes the photographer doesn't know what's going on in Ottawa, of what the government's saying or doing. So I think it's a case-per-case -case basis, but I, there are a lot of times where there are photo editors who, uh, not all, in case some are in this crowd, uh, who do meddle, who do start changing things, who do start cropping the photographs. And, and you kind of lose, like, I don't, this empty space, I'm like, yeah, but the ground, it gives you a feeling of what it was like there. You know, the sand or the trees, you got to understand what it, and, and, and they just start in their mind thinking, page realities cropping, I got to put the, you know, the mast head, like, you'll see photos in there where I, I as a photographer, I'm looking, I'm like, wow, why did he shoot this so wide? Oh, he wants to get the cover of the magazine, he left the space for the mast head and some type down the side. But I'll tell you, in the middle of combat, I'm not thinking that, sometimes. I just have one more question before uh, um, putting the floor for questions. Um, <coughs> it's about style, and uh, you know that I'm very interested in this, and, and especially in, in the framework of photojournalism. Would you say that you have a style, and uh, if you have one, uh, w what is your style? Style, that's a really, I gotta watch the answer to that question. Uh, I think, I accept that some people use the word style. I would just see, I would say I have a certain way of seeing. It could be style if some people want to use that word. Uh, I like to do very raw pictures, very simple, straightforward pictures. I mean, uh, again, this photo was edited out. I, I, I would never really put a photograph like that in. I, I like, you know, when I look at the Farm Security Administration, does everybody know who that is? If you, okay, in case you don't, very important sort of period of photography, which was by some people, in the American School of the History of Photography, considered sort of the birthplace of documentary photography, which, by the way, was commissioned by the U.S. government. This is, you know. Uh, and it was very raw and straight. It's about that experientiality of, of going somewhere and seeing it. It's not about blurring, and I do, I do that too sometimes, blurring and, and space and, and layering and capturing the moment. It's about that straight experienti experientiality where you go there, it's like, there it is, bang, you click it and you go. Uh, Style, I think I have styles. I don't know if I have one style. I get, I get bored very quick making the same picture over and over, so I, I, I kind of just shift uh, uh, platforms, so to speak. Great. Uh, <coughs> and we have mics on the aisle, I think. Um, who has a question? <coughs> yes. So we're going to try to pass the mics, but you're like there's a lot of people. But we're recording the lecture, so please try to speak loud or wait for the microphone. Thank you. When you're returning from a war zone, how do you regroup and rebalance so that you can go back again? Mm -hmm. So everybody heard that? Uh, well, I I'll speak broadly because I, I think the the the, the Collective experience of journalists needs to be understood. We'll just speak of journalists who cover war. Uh, well, the first, I mean, I, I've done a lot of stuff before I covered Afghanistan, but just say, let's say that my first active war was Afghanistan in 2006. The first thing I did was I came back, I went to the bar and completely got plastered. Like to the point where I passed out. Because I, I was, there's no like, hey, when you come home school, you know, that doesn't exist for, for a lot of journalists. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's, uh, you know, exercise. You know, I, I usually don't drink when I come back from, from a war because it's just, it's just going to fog my head from, from doing that kind of stuff. I, I had a therapist for a while. Uh, you know, I think that there's this big thing in the media about don't talk about mental illness, man. You think you're crazy. But look, if you break your arm, you go to the arm doctor. If you break your head, you go to the head doctor. It's the same thing, you know. Uh, I, I think it's... I have friends who are like, you know, like there's a buddy group, you have friends you talk to. Uh, and I just judge from there in terms of taking time off. I, I've not covered a war since, I, 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 said, I said I was gonna cover another war after Afghanistan, then I went and did Mexico. But that, that, was, a, that was something I, I could work within. Uh, I, I know friends who have a lot of challenges, you know, who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, some of them have a hard time leaving their house. Some people like walk for an hour around their house before they can go to the subway. You know, it's about crowds. Sometimes it's frequencies of sounds. Chatter, chatter 
I had a friend who, when the chatter got loud in a room, it, it, it hit a frequency like gunfire, and he would start, you know, have anxiety attacks. So he'd just go outside, catch his breath. So, but there's no like, and, and there might be out there, but they're impossible to find. There's no like hotline 101. But uh, uh, usually I, I hang out with my family. I think hanging out with my family has been probably the most important thing. You know, family is, and friends are the most important things in life. So that sort of regroups your mind. And some people quit. Some people don't cover any war anymore. So th there's no single one answer, but I want it to be more of a collective answer for the whole community. Hi, uh, my name is Cyrus, and I am a filmmaker. Um, the question I, wa I wanted to ask you if you can expand on is the idea of consent with your subjects, mm -hmm. uh, specifically around, you talked about the platoon, the shots of the platoon, and mm -hmm. I'm surmising they gave you permission or consent. Uh, how does that work when the person cannot or there are instances where you don't get the consent, and does it really matter to you and you and your work? So everybody heard that, it's about consent. And uh, I, I learned, I, I faced this, uh, you know, I was a staff photographer at the Globe and Mail for six years, 2001 to 2007. And uh, I covered a lot of different things at the Globe. I did 400 assignments a year, some years, and you know, funerals, murders, all sorts of things. Uh, I remember there was this funeral, and it was, I forgot exactly the name of the family. There's a funeral, and, and their son was murdered brutally and it was very sensational sort of stories all around it and how it happened and what went on. And uh, the, the parents called my photo editor and said, we don't want you there. We don't want you to cover this. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't want to cover it either. Like, it, it doesn't feel great showing up at a murder scene where people are screaming over their, their loved ones. But my photo editor said, look, this isn't the public's interest. And I said, I don't give a shit about the public's interest. But then I thought, well, look, if there's, if there's a, a, a rapist going around and raping people, th don't we need to all know that? And I think that there's a balance. It's, it's a case-per-case -case basis. I think it is within the, it, in the public's interest. W with, with the Marines, I, I went out with the military on that. And obviously, there were guys who didn't want their photograph taken. They said, I don't want, I don't want my photograph taken. And obviously, for a portrait, you need the consent because you need to <laughs> stand in front of the camera for you and pose. But... Uh, uh, with news, I, I've been in the middle of firefights where guys are dragging their dead friend down the trench, and they're they're like, "Don't fucking take pictures with it." You, I've been threatened, and uh, or I've had friends who've gotten out of the medevac helicopter. <clears throat> I think there's some Marines loading some children they accidentally mortared, and one of the Marines walked right up to my friend, the photographer, and punched him in the face. I'm telling you, you know, like. It's all haywire. You're 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 allowed to be there, and you it's loud. The helicopter can get punched in the face, and it's like, well, I, I use balance. There are times where I haven't taken photographs. Like I was in the back of a medevac helicopter, and they loaded a guy in, and his legs had been blown off. Just below, like everything from the waist down was gone. He was still alive, and he was going to survive probably, and he was screaming about losing all his parts underneath. I just put my cameras behind me and I just kind of looked out the window because I just thought, this I'm not going to photograph. So it's a case-per-case -case basis. I'm dealing with extreme issues here. But there are times where I've photographed soldiers with their comrades who have been killed and they have gotten angry at me because there's a lot of emotion. They feel like I'm taking advantage of what's going on. I have been grabbed by soldiers and thrown to the ground. But there hasn't been a single episode or, or situation like that where later on they didn't come to me and apologize and said, I'm glad you photographed that, because I want people back home to know what's going on here. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Because um, <clears throat> the question I have is, I mean, we, we, that's a very recurrent question, of, which is a question of ethic, and, the, and even the question of moral. Okay, shall we take the photograph, or shall we show or not the photograph? And uh, the question I've always had uh, is, um, would you, 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 would you think differently if you wouldn't be a photographer but an illustrator? I mean, using another medium. You, w you would be there. I mean, that's what exactly happened during the 19th century. I mean, Constantin Gis, who was covering the Crimean War, was, uh, did amazing drawing. And that these drawings 
that affected a lot the UK at that moment, not the photograph by Fenton. Um, so my question is, uh, if you were using a northern medium, would you think differently? Well, I think the difference here is that the general perception by, by uh, you know, well, in drawings you can change things, you know. You could, hey, I don't want the mother to see this young man's dead body. Uh, I can change the face a little or I can hide the face. With photographs, it, it's, it's our best invention as to seeing something that is real going on. Uh, so the video was... Video as well, yeah, video as well. And uh, uh, I, I think, I think, no, I, I was about to say artist, but you're going to trap me there, but in a good way, in a good way. Uh, I think that artists who use, you know, paint or drawing, painting and drawing, which isn't as, as realistic as a photograph in its representation, can change things and make things more acceptable. But I think seeing it like, oh my God, th that, you know, that, is that real? And in a drawing, a lot, sometimes people don't, at least now, don't believe it's real as much. So I think that uh, in the ethics, well, people aren't right there in front of you, so they don't know the author. Well, the photographer, I'm freaking right there, and when I take the picture, they just know I took a photo. And knowing I'm a press photographer, they know I'm going to put it somewhere. And I'm going to put a photo of someone that they really care for, dead or dying, or seriously wounded, somewhere where everybody's going to see it. And they feel like it's a spectacle. You're making a spectacle of my friend who's just died with his legs blown off or something to that effect. And I think that having the author there in front, they get to challenge the maker of that, that, that image right on the spot. Whereas an artist like, I don't know where this freaking guy who drew this is. And I think that the difference between the drawings now as well is that now it goes online. I'm wondering what people are twittering right now, you know. It goes online right away and, and everybody sees it right away. And I think that there's... Uh, a bit of a, 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 an emotional reaction with photography that is a little more extreme because these are very private moments, but they aren't private moments. In a war, it's not private. It's, it's, it involves so many more people, and I think that uh, the, the draw, I'm going to call it the painters, the painters and the drawers, I can't say artists because I'm an artist, uh, can, can get away with a little bit more in that because they can manipulate and not only that, they don't, they don't adhere to a code of ethics like I do. And I think that, that that really separates us. I love painters and drawers if you're out there, but. Yes, you have a question. Uh, hello, my name is Andre. Um, question, I have two questions for you. First question is why? Why is it that you go out there and um, risk your life? Is it the rush? Is it just that you want to capture and uh, let people know um, what is going on in, in areas where it's peaceful and, and it, where it's not peaceful. And uh, the second question is, um, do you think we're getting it? Do you, think, do you think all these images that you're taking, do you think here in the West, here where, where it's peaceful, do, we, do you think we are understanding what these people are going through out there? And why hasn't there been any change? That's three questions, but I'll get all three. I'll get all three. Okay, I, I'm going to kind of go a little backwards and, and go over those questions. Remind me if I miss one. Sorry, there's the why. I'm going to have to write this down. I'm getting old. Why uh, getting it, just so I can remember. And what was that last part there? Why getting it and what? Why hasn't there been any change? A, a, no change. Okay, okay. Okay, impact. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, uh, you, you know what the great thing is, is you said the West. Well, with the internet, I get the world. My, my stuff's been published uh, everywhere, and it doesn't matter if it's the Globe and Mail because you can see the Globe and Mail's content in China. Well, maybe not China, Australia. <laughs> Depends what the article's on. Uh, so I think getting it, I think some people do get it. Uh, I've done some work that has, I did a lot of work around the asbestos issue where I know it has engaged a lot of people, policymakers, you know, governments. Uh, I, I think that when you go to the polls and you've been seeing photographs of Afghanistan, it doesn't matter if you're like, wow, this war is so horrible. I think when you see that $18 billion tax, I don't mind being straight about this, see that $18 billion tax bill from going to that war, 
people aren't like, wow, man, is that, you know, do, I'm not judging the war either way, but it's for you to judge. It's for you, you are the individuals that make the votes. Was that worth it? Uh, are we going to war again, like with ISIS? Do we want to do this? Is this something we should be fighting or not? So I think getting it, I'm a part of a big group of people who are trying to help people understand if they get it. It's up to the individual. I think it's your responsibility to want to get it in your own way. Uh, no change or impact. Well, I think there's been lots of change and impact. Uh, I, I, I'm going to point out just a few things. Uh, you look at the Holocaust, okay? And you look at Rwanda. And you look at The Hague. Imagine, you know, people have been tried at The Hague recently. Look, not, we haven't gotten everybody. We mean the sort of the, the world of democracy wanting no war and genocides. I, I think there has been a lot of change. Uh, we have a Geneva Convention. Is it perfect? Does it always work? No. But at least it's a great base and a start. There has been a lot of change. I think that uh, there are a lot of laws in place. Like going back to the mining, uh, you, know, you know how many labor laws are out there for you to do anything? And those labor laws came from the deaths of a lot of workers in the workplaces. You know how many people died of industrial diseases like silicosis, asbestosis, and see, people still die of this stuff all the time. You know, every time I see someone get killed on the job, I think, how the hell did that happen? And then people get charged because th there has been some change. I think we have advanced, you know. Uh, yeah, there's still chemical weapons out there, but think of World War II. Even Hitler didn't use chemical weapons. He's like, no way, man, I'm not going, I'm not going to that. And he did other horrible things. But I think there has been change. Uh, nuclear, other than testing, nuclear weapons haven't been used since the Second World War. So I, I think we have to credit ourselves a little bit. It's not perfect. The world is certainly going to shit right now. But the world's always going to shit. When is there, when isn't there a war or, a, or a, a plague? or? And now we're talking about war, but who cares about, about this? I mean, we are global warming ourselves to death. So it, it's, it's crazy. All, all the, the money we spend on wars or trying to fix countries, but in the end, we're killing ourselves with creating energy. And why? Going back to the why. Wow, this guy really hogged the questions. Why? I think I briefly got into that earlier on. It's not for the rush. There are photographers I know who do that. And if they want to do that, that's great. I don't I have a problem with that because they're all a part of a system where we're getting the pictures out there. Everybody has their own reason. But uh, again, my parents were born before the Second World War. Every night at the table, I heard a story about the war. And it, I just, it became about storytelling. And I don't think of it like, oh, I'm going out there. I might lose my life. I don't think of it like that. I'm here today, I'm in one piece, because I was smart and I didn't get hurt. So and I, I did a lot of training, and I really calculate everything I do out there. It's not perfect, but I calculate everything I do out there, so I do come back in one piece. Question? Um, to go back to an earlier point you made about, um, I believe, Luc Delahaye's other portrait of the, uh, the dead Taliban. Um, you mentioned that you, you felt there was, and, and forgive me if I'm paraphrasing incorrectly, um, but you said the word sensational. And I, I wanted to, I guess, um, ask you to expand on that a little bit in light of, say, you know, your portrait. You have a portrait in there of um, this soldier with the, I think it says, yep. towards the enemy or yep, whatever. front towards enemy. Yeah, along those lines. Um, so, you know, what, what do you feel is the fine line between, I guess, sensationalizing an observation? If you consider, for example, a photograph viewed in the context of a global community as opposed to, say, you know, frankly, a Western-dominated um, mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <clears throat> I think what I'd say is uh, I think we're in a world now where there is no, like, Canadian view or the Toronto view. Uh, I can talk about styles of photography or different pictures in there, and I might like this. We're, we're in an empowered world right now where you just pull your phone out of your pocket, you got like encyclopedias and academic essays of all kinds. And I think that we, we have many more clusters of, of different groups of people who think differently, and I think these are the best societies. Societies where people have different views. So for you, one picture might be sensational of a dead body. Someone might find the, the picture, the portrait of the soldier where it says front towards enemy, which is actually 
what's written on the front of a, a claymore mine. So he's like, conf like, he's, like he's a weapon. That's what he's put that for. It, it's a mine you set and you blast it in a certain way. So uh, uh, he's also asserting breaking the rules. You know, the Marines, you follow every single rule. For him to write that in his helmet, he probably got punished, actually. So it's a little bit of him sort of rebelling. Uh, well, what's sensational? I think it's all relative to the creator of the images as well, or, or the viewer, depending on what the viewer is, what their tolerance is. Th that's not such a sensational photograph for me because I've covered suicide bombings where there's 30 body parts and two heads in the middle of the road. Showing that in a particular way, depending on what the light, the composition, and how I sh photograph it, that could be very sensational. So that, th relative to my experience, that's not very sensational. You know, I, I remember when I got back from Afghanistan the first time, I was pretty traumatized. I didn't, I kept saying why and why, I don't understand. I went to see my family doctor who uh, uh, had been a doctor in the Second World War. He was in, uh, the, he was in Czechoslovakia and there was an air raid and he was walking to work and uh, uh, he told me the story and there was a man digging through some rubble and two Nazi officers walked up and shot him in the head, laughed, lit a cigarette and kept walking. And he was just like, oh my God. And then this, this other person ran up and said, the, the Germans he had heard said, see, this is what we do to looters. And this woman came running up and going, oh my God, he was digging through the rubble for his sister. And see, we think you walk out in the streets of Toronto that this is normal life. Well, this is normal life to us. In Kandahar, normal life is, will a suicide bomber run up to me and blow themselves up with me? So I think that what's sensational and what, it, and what the background of experience in an in a ongoing globalized world is, is many different things. And I think with the, the migration of people, especially with how multicultural Toronto is, which I think is a fantastic thing, I could go show someone a photograph who's just immigrated freshly from Pakistan. I could go show a the same photograph to someone who had just come here from Afghanistan. And then I could just show my parents. My parents might find it shocking Someone who had just maybe been in the Afghan army would be like, well, I've, I saw that every day. So I, I think we're in a much more complex time now where there isn't just one view of what's sensational. No problem. Hi, uh, my name is Jean-Marie. I'm a first year student. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to make a point. Somebody asked earlier if, like, if, they th if you thought that you were making an impact, and I just wanted to make a point that before I came here, I had gone to the gallery and I'd seen your work and it definitely resonated with me and I didn't link you as the artist who had done that. Um, I'm not a politician. I will not, I'm not gonna go out there and like fight for, against war. Um, but I definitely want to let you know that you've like, insp you've inspired me in the way that I can use photography as a tool to expose these things and made me think about what can I do as a photographer, what my talents are to expose these things and expose them to public. So I just wanted to say that I think you are sort of inspiring people in different ways. Um, my question was sort of elaborating from what somebody else asked earlier. Have you ever felt torn um, in a moment where you feel as though you're responsible, like you can intervene, do you see something happen? And what is your responsibility, to take a picture and show the world what's really going on, or intervene and stop that event from happening? Has there ever like, been that moment? And how do you decide whether you just, exp what's more important, exposing it to everyone else or helping that person? Okay. Uh, this is a really good question. Uh, there's two kinds of intervening, I'd say. There's intervening like someone's about to shoot somebody or stab them, and you're like, hey, don't do that, you know, or please don't do that, or actually physically trying to stop them or saying, please, you gotta be careful physically going in because you could end up dead as well. Uh, and then there's intervening, I don't know if it's intervening or what I call the humanitarian, you know, like I don't carry a weapon, I don't wanna carry a weapon, it's not what I do. I don't judge people who do that and that's what their role is in, in the war or conflict or whatever the situation is. But uh, there have been times where there's a casualty and the fourth person carrying the stretcher is not there. Uh, it's me. And they just look at me, and in, in humanitarian situations, I, I have not, that's happened many times. I've done lots of frontline first aid. 
of all kinds. Uh, and I will never ever uh, say, well, I'm busy taking pictures, you, you hold the intestines in. Uh, and that's how extreme it is in this business. And I know a lot of friends who've had to do that. Uh, if they say pass the machine gun, I probably will not pass the machine gun. Uh, in terms of intervening, I personally, sorry, the power cord is about to die here. Uh, I have never, okay, I, not I've never, but I've seen people, the worst for me, uh, like a fist fight, n never with guns, but uh, if it's a case per case basis, you know, war, it, it's very confusing out there. Everybody thinks it's very cut and dry. There's a lot going on. Uh, you have to, you think you're a step back, but you're not. Maybe you're, you're two steps forward. I use that symbolically in what's going on. People are doing things, and it's so outside of our daily experience here. It's so extreme to the darkness of what humanity is that I try and read sort of the rules of what war crimes are, and then even then, those don't help you out there. Because maybe you've just seen 30 people get killed in a day, and your mind is just turned off, and you're not even paying attention anymore. Uh, I have, with, with, with detainees, I have uh, asked, like, hey, you should give him water, you know, things like this. It's not that they're bad soldiers, it's just there's a lot of shit going on. There's people trying to kill you every day, and I think it's about trying to remind people they're human beings. And so without getting into too many detailed stories, uh, I think that the important thing is the fundamental, is that psychologically, we don't talk about the psychological part of war. Sometimes the people who perpetrate uh, crimes are, are, and I take this out of the World War II part of it, they just think they're following orders. They're like, hey, go do this, and they're trained, do this, do this, do this, do this. And, th and then they're in the real situation, and it's not like the training anymore. So, okay, yeah, bound the guy's hands, stick his face against the wall, put him in a stress position. Maybe that guy was told, he is a Taliban, he killed five guys. Oops, wrong guy. That actually was a poor farmer. We mistook, we, we made a mistake. So I think that it, it's about reminding people about their humanity. And I think that that's the way I try and engage the situations I've been in. I just want to add something. Uh, that the, the, what you're describing here is the role of the photographer uh, in combat zone and, uh, and, uh, and, and the work as, uh, as a mediator, you know, do, do the go-between. And uh, it has always been something complicated, and the press has always been uh, acknowledging that. And in the show, you have a series of photographs uh, made by uh, Jimmy Eyre, you remember mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's published in 1904. It's a very interesting photographic series because of the date of publication and because of many other things. But if you look closely, you'll see that the last photograph is a photograph of Jimmy Air himself and uh, giving, you know, uh, helping a wounded soldier here. And, and I think that from the very beginning, we are in 1904. I mean, you know, photography I, I, in the press is really, really happening. And at that, that very <coughs> moment, in one of the very first series of photography like this, the last photograph is the photograph of the photographer. And I think it's telling a lot about the role, about the ethics, you know, and, uh, and about the press and about the photographer and all the process of publishing images in the press. I have one more question. Yes, please, in the back there. Yeah, all the way in the back there. Hey man, how's it? Oh, I haven't seen you long. Have old friend of mine. <coughs> okay, so am I perceived as a, a Canadian or American? And uh, you know, the days of the the Canadian flag on the backpack, you know, and everybody invites you in their house in Europe or wherever you are. Uh, that that's that's like a myth, you know. And, and, and I would say another myth is, since we went to Afghanistan, now everybody sees us, we're bad. Uh, no, uh, actually, they don't really care about Canada too much because we're kind of boring in the eyes of the international world. I'm Canadian, just to say that. We're kind of boring, and it's like, wow, we're sending six jets to Iraq. Like, oh my God, it's a D-Day invasion, you know. Now, I'm not making fun of the Canadian military, but they make jokes about themselves as well. So, you know, really, when you think about it, we sent 2,500 troops to Afghanistan. Uh, the, the U.S. 
had at, at its peak probably 90,000. Of that 2,500, only less than 1,000 were combat troops. I'm not diminishing the contribution, but really we're a small country who thinks we're big, but really we're surrounded by two oceans, the Arctic, and we have a border with the United States who no one messes with us because of them. And that is the truth and the reality. So we are kind of cut off from the world, and the world is kind of cut off from us. They see us when the hockey's on the Olympics. I love my country. It's a cool country. But we're a much smaller player than we think we are. Uh, but and on that note, we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I just, I'll just add. So sometimes people Canadian. think I'm American. Sometimes people think I'm American. Sometimes people think I'm Canadian. When I worked outside the military in Kandahar, I grew a beard and I dressed locally, and no one, everybody thought I was Afghan. So I try not make that a thing unless I need it. So. Thank you so very much. Um, unfortunately, we're closing in five minutes, three minutes, so um, you won't be able to see the show tonight, but please come back if you haven't seen it. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Have a good night. <laughs>